the, uh, the lawyers have made some agreement on how they want to present arguments. So if somebody would tell me what the game plan is, we will do our best to accommodate you. Sure, Your Honor. I, this is Jennifer Edwards on behalf of Dr. Verdeja and Baker Medical Group. I believe the co-petitioner, Ms. Denizard for South Florida Baptist Hospital, would like just one minute of argument time, and then we'll take the rest of it. Okay. That is correct, Your Honor. All righty. So we're ready to go when you are. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Jennifer Edwards, and I represent petitioners Dr. Verdeja and Baker Medical Group. I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. All right. There is only one issue before the court today, and that issue is whether a claimant is required pursuant to the medical negligence pre-suit requirements in Chapter 766 of Florida Statutes to investigate and corroborate by way of an expert qualified to comment on causation that the alleged negligence of a potential medical malpractice defendant caused injury to the claimant. And I wanna make it clear from the outset of my argument that what is not at issue here today are the qualifications of the respondent's pre-suit expert, gynecologist, Dr. Gary Brickner. We are not asking this court let me make sure I understand, because I think we can get to the nut of it. Your position is that <clears throat> essentially the plaintiff is required to get an oncologist to say that the delayed diagnosis resulted in the injuries of which she presumably will be complaining in the action, right? That's correct. And that the gynecologist couldn't opine as to causation or the resulting injury. Am I got you right on that? That's correct. But the statute doesn't require, what the statute requires is that the corroborating witness, the corroborating expert, specialize in the same specialty as the defendant. And there's no oncologist that's been named as a defendant in this suit, only a gynecologist. And the theory of liability is that the gynecologist didn't, sufficiently understand the the fact that the plaintiff's breasts were dense and what that means on a clear mammogram in the first instance and whether she should have been referred for further diagnostics. And the gynecologist opined, the expert, Dr. Brickner, I think, opined to that as being causative, you know, he within the criteria of the statute. And so we're in the statute other than the part that it says negligence resulted in injury, we have to read the whole thing together. There are reasonable grounds to believe that a named defendant was negligent and that negligence resulted in injury. And that's to be provided in the affidavit of the expert. It doesn't say that you have to have an expert for each element of the negligence claim. And that's sort of what you're asking us to do, isn't it? Um, that is what, I, what we're asking this court to do. And I can address a couple of those issues first. I think you're referring to 766.1025 when you're talking about the statute only requires um, a same specialty expert. But that statute also makes clear that that statute only applies to testimony relating to the standard of care. So that statute is inapplicable to the issue before the court today. Well, actually, I was looking, the statute I was looking at was 203. And what it says is the claimant has to investigate to ascertain reasonable grounds to believe that negligent and caused injury, and that that is to be corroborated by the expert. And my we're the my fundamental problem here. I think I have two fundamental problems here. One is I don't think that the legislature directed that the corroboration has to be on an element by element basis. I think that what the legislature wants and it is prescribed is an expert in the specialty that the, the named defendant and that whose report meets the criteria of 203. I also think that what you're asking us to do on a substantive level is assess the qualification. It, 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 the, you're, you're not challenging the gynecologist's qualifications to opine to something because he's clearly qualified within the meaning of uh, the 102. But the 
what you're asking us to do on a substantive level, to me, runs directly afoul of Carmody, because what this what the Supreme Court told us in that case is we are not on certiorari authorized to review the substantive qualifications of the corroborating expert. And we necessarily would have to pass on that to adopt your argument. So help me out with that. Sure. First of all, we do believe that the legislator required an investigation and corroboration by a qualified expert as to the causation and damages aspect of a claim. And there's a few reasons for that. One, we know that the intent of, of this act was to eliminate frivolous claims. We know based on black letter law that a negligence claim requires four elements, that's duty, breach, causation, and damages. When you look at 766.2032, even from a visual aesthetic, the legislator has broken that down into part A, which is separate. Well, than stay with me on Carmody for a minute, because okay. that's really what we have to confront. It's mm -hmm. recent, it's directly applicable, and your opponent has certainly taken the position that it controls the outcome of this case. So, you know, towards the end of the opinion, Justice Cordell writes, the district court can grant certiorari review to verify that the plaintiff submitting submitted the corroborating affidavit. But here, Carmody checked that box. And like what the petitioners and Carmody were doing, you are asking us to look at whether this expert was sufficiently qualified to opine and corroborate within the requirements of the statute. And that's exactly what was rejected in Carmody. So I, this is where I look, I mean, I wrote Jackman and we, you know, we had to learn Carmody and I understand your frustration, but I don't know how we get around. The box was checked and it is not within our purview at this, in this jurisdictional context to pass on the substantive qualifications or as in here, what you're doing is saying the expert, the corroboration is insufficient substantively because it doesn't cover the causation element of the claim. But to make that determination, I don't see how we don't go into substantive versus box checking. Sure. And I think, you know, a review of the hearing transcript can really kind of flesh this out because the issue before the trial court was basically two boxes that we asked the trial court to, to check. And the first one is the issue that's before the court today. And that's whether the statutes require a pre-suit investigation corroborated by a qualified expert into causation. If the trial court said, yes, I agree with you, then we get to box B. But that's not what the statute says. What the statute says is you have to have a corroborating expert who practices in the same discipline as the named defendant. We don't have an oncologist. We do have a gynecologist. The affidavit was submitted by a gynecologist. Box checked, case closed, we're done. If there was an oncologist named as a defendant in this case, then I think we would have something else to talk about here. But without that, I, I'm struggling with what we can do within the confines of our jurisdiction as it's been defined by the Supreme Court. If you were to have an oncologist, the oncologist would not be able to opine on the standard of care of a gynecologist. Isn't that right, Ms. Edwards? That's correct. You would require two experts in this specific case where the defendant specialty is not qualified to comment on the causation. What's, what's your best case where to suggest that the legislature contemplated multiple experts? Because all, all we're talking about establishing is that there's a reasonable basis to believe that medical malpractice happened. But we're not we're not looking to uh, to solve the case at, at this initial point. And I agree with that, Your Honor. But the only way to eliminate frivolous claims is to corroborate both duty and breach, which is the standard of care and causation and damages. And when you're not corroborating causation and damages, you are not eliminating frivolous claims, which is what the legislator intended. But, but if, I'm, if, 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 if I'm opining on the standard of care, what, what I'm going to come down to is that a gynecologist is going to opine on what another gynecologist should have done 
when the mammogram results came back, rate uh, apparently raising an issue. And that's separate and distinct from at the at, at the jury trial of showing the causation. And and this this expert opined on, on what he suspected a a resulting cause was of a co gynecologist missing the mammogram, mammogram results. Respectfully, I, I disagree. I think 766.203, specifically the fact that it's broken down into part A and part B is very clear and unambiguous that it does require a separate investigation and investigation is defined as including a corroborating expert affidavit as to simply the causation and damages aspect of the claim. And what's what's your best case? Best case? Is, what's, what's a case that says that, that the court says, I'm going to require two experts? Well, I think if you look at Howell versus Balchunas, that is a case that was against a radiologist defendant. So they only got one expert affidavit, and that was of a radiologist. That radiologist accurately, or I guess, complied with part A of 766.203, and that he said there's a, that that radiologist breached the standard of care. He is not qualified to testify about what would happen after that or what would be caused by that. And so he said in that affidavit, there's a reasonable basis to believe that this misinterpretation then led others to miss the correct diagnosis. The first DCA looked to REL, looked to this court's opinion and said, that's not enough. You have got to corroborate the injury and consequence causation. And well, in that REL, case- REL, but the thing about that, I think where you kind of lose some traction there is REL kind of went by the way with the advent of Carmody. And that brings me to a separate question that is really ethereal, but it strikes me that this particular case probably had a timeline such that the motion to dismiss timeframe preceded the ruling in Carmody and the amendment of 9.130. So if you had, if this was presented in the context of a denial of a motion to dismiss, we would have jurisdiction without the constraints of certiorari requirements. I don't know what the case would look like past that, but at least it, it strikes me that you were sort of caught in the crossfire of the timing of how to present this. And now the only way that you can get review is by certiorari. And Carmody has foreclosed certiorari and all but the procedural failure to check box in accordance with the word, you know, the precise requirements of the statute. And I see that the statute calls for causation, but as Judge LaRose, you know, points out, all we're looking at here is what the, what the statute has told us we have to look for is a, an expert who can corroborate reasonable grounds that whatever the defendant, which it has to be in the same specialty, and here it was, you didn't handle the read on this mammogram correctly, gynecologist. If you had, you would have ordered additional diagnostics and whatever time went by until she was diagnosed wouldn't have gone by. And then you're at trial to prove your causation and damages. But I, it just, it strikes me that Carmody has um, meaningfully curtailed certiorari jurisdiction and that the precedents that preceded, you know, Jackman and I've forgotten the other case that was named in the conflict in Carmody, but most of the, the those cases are of little utility to you at this point. And, and I hear what you're saying about Carmody and respectfully, I disagree because in this case, the respondent's attorney has agreed that Dr. Brickner is not qualified to comment on causation. You can find that in their correspondence in our appendix, which is on page A99. And they can see that generally he's not qualified. They go on to articulate that they understand that an oncology expert would be required. 
And so the qualifications of Dr. Brickner were never weighed. There was no determination of sufficiency of evidence like there was in Carmody. That's because we agree that he's qualified to render a standard of care opinion. They agree he's not qualified to render a causation opinion. And therefore, the issue in this case is purely procedural. And it's whether a claimant is required to corroborate their investigation into causation by a qualified expert that's qualified to comment on causation. And anything short of that really renders the legislative um, requirements in 766.2032B completely meaningless. If you don't have to, if you don't have to get a qualified expert to corroborate causation, why there's no point of doing any investigation into it. In most cases, the same expert may be qualified to comment on both, but not this case. And we think the legislation, the statute is very clear that it requires both corroboration of standard of care and causation and damages. Ms. Edwards, if, excuse me, but you are into your rebuttal time. Use it as you wish, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. Um, I'll go ahead and, and reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal then. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, Ms. Denizard, do you want us to take your minute? Or... Yes, Your Honor, I can go ahead and address the court now. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Frances Denizard, and I represent the petitioner, South Florida Baptist Hospital. At the trial level, we joined Dr. Verdejas and Baker Medical Group's motion to determine the reasonableness of the pre-suit investigation and the motion for summary judgment. Uh, our joinder was denied along with Dr. Verdeja's motion due to the issues and the arguments being the same in our petition as Dr. Verdeja's. We filed it on a post motion to consolidate the appeals, which was granted. Uh, and so at this point, we would adopt Dr. Verdeja's and Baker Medical Group's oral arguments to this court and would request the same uh, relief be granted to South Florida Baptist Hospital. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Ms. Colon, you are okay. up. You got it right. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Lisa Colon on behalf of the respondents. Um, I, I think Judge Libret made most of my argument for me, which I think the starting point for this case has to be Kermati. And one of um, the conflict cases actually was this court's opinion, uh, this court's decision in Clara versus Lynch. And in essence, um, the argument in Clara versus Lynch is not dissimilar to that which is argued here. And that was the expert who gave the affidavit, wasn't qualified, and this court determined that in view of that, there's a deficient, deficiency and there's non-compliance, and therefore it's somehow procedural. Carmody really did close the door on that argument. Um, and this argument today really ultimately is no different. The argument here today is this expert is not qualified. So uh, please address your friend on the other side, the point that she made towards the end of her argument, which is given the concession in the correspondence, and, and you can address both the, the, the fulsomeness of the concession, but given that, if viewing that somewhat favorably to, your, to the other side, she contends that this becomes purely procedural because you don't, there is no oncologist. So help me out with addressing that argument. Please. Okay, I, I have to, I actually don't have the letter in front of me, but what I will say, it's probably a very poorly drafted letter that did not firmly say, understand, we understand your issue, however, we understand what you're, what you're asking. However, the statute does not require that we provide a separate, um, expert on causation. The statute does not require that we provide you with an oncologist because the injury is an oncological injury. And I think that that's a letter drafted quickly in pre-suit. I didn't draft it myself, but <laughs> I argued the response to uh, the motion to determine the reasonableness and raised firmly that 
The statute does not require both. Had we obtained an oncologist to give an opinion, the argument would have been you didn't obtain, obtain a gynecologist and the defendant is a gynecologist. Had we um, gotten multiple experts, it would have been, well, you can't you can't have multiple experts because the statute only requires one. So, you know, the argument during the hearing, I think, is probably what you need to rely on and not the quickly drafted letter that said we disagree with your position that we need to do more than we've done at this stage. Would you would you concede that if this matter proceeds to trial, you're going to need a uh, an oncologist? Certainly, because you have to continue through, through proving all of the specifics of, of the damages that resulted from the delayed diagnosis, from the fact that she didn't send her for an additional mammogram. Of course you would, but that's not what's required at the pre-suit stage. That's your proof at trial. And at the pre-suit stage, you're just simply corroborating the fact that there was negligence and there was an injury. Um, so this multiple expert Thing, but the, I the, think. The, his, his opinion speaks in terms of a, uh, I guess, a delay in treatment. Is, is, is that the injury? No, he actually says okay. there's a delayed treatment and there was the result was the fact that there's this more severe prognosis, which means there's there's extensive treatment. You know, I, I could it have been more well written and explained each and every identifying each and everything that the woman had to go through as a result of um, delaying that diagnosis? Possibly, but that's again not what's required. And frankly, well, if, a, if 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 a if a gynecologist familiar with the standard of care says you should have caught this result, and based on his training experience. Missing that clue leads to greater injury. That's what, right? Yeah. And I guess, I, well, that's that's what an expert gynecologist is going to say. Right. I and think. an expert gynecologist is going to say, had you caught it at this point, um, you don't have the time within which cancer continues to grow and your ultimate treatment and injury is more severe than it would have been had you removed the tumor at that point in time. Um, but I think we're going far afield of what needed to be done at this stage and what this court has the jurisdiction to consider because now we're getting into the nuts and bolts and the meat of what the evidence will ultimately be at trial. Um, and that's not what that's not what is required at this stage. We are supposed to put them on notice of the claim. And we did that. Um, we provided an affidavit from an expert who tracked exactly to the statute and the requirement that we then come forward with an additional expert or a hybrid expert is just simply not in the statute. Um, and going through the details of what's in the affidavit is what Carmody said this court should not be doing. But if if Ms. Edwards is correct, after two or three years of discovery, and et cetera, you're going to get to trial and you're either not going to get a, an oncologist to testify or you'd probably come across an oncologist who's going to say, eh, missing that result didn't cause any harm. Uh, wouldn't it be better to cut that off at the pre-suit stage? I think that the court respectfully is sort of mixing your, <laughs> your reasonable grounds to proceed with the requirement that you prove your entire case. And the statute just says, are there reasonable grounds to proceed? They want to avoid frivolity, but they also want to give the other side an opportunity maybe to settle because it's also the entire scheme is set up so that there is some degree of punishment if you don't recognize that you have a, a valid claim and make offers to settle, arbitrate, and so forth, and the damages increase and and um, you know, there's caps on there's caps on your damages if you don't accept the offer to arbitrate and so forth. So I, I think that there's a you can't you, you can't confuse the two. You can't say at this stage, you must show A, B, C, D, as as uh, counsel put it, you have to show duty and breach and and 
causation and damages. And that's simply just not what's in the statute. You're re you would be reading much more into the statute. Basically what you're saying is if the legislature wanted to have a plaintiff as part of its pre-suit assign an expert to each of the elements of the negligence claim, the legislature could have told all of us that Correct. and required multiple specialties if necessary to prove the claim. Is that correct? Does that accurately correct. exactly? Exactly. There's nothing. The word injury, in fact, does not reappear anywhere in the qualification sex subsections of the statutes. The word injury appears once, and that's in seven sixty six point two zero three two. Thereafter, your cross reference to two other. Uh, subsections of the statute. Well, this is probably really basic, but I, uh, what I'm struggling with here is the gynecologist can opine that the defendant should have ordered more testing based on the condition of this plaintiff's breasts when a clear mammogram came back. And because he didn't, it took her several more months to being diagnosed, at which point she learned that she had cancer and had to go through a bunch of treatment. And, you know, if the diagnostics had been done earlier, that treatment presumably would have been less and less ravaging, right? That's your theory. Correct. And so it strikes me that a lot of this is proof as opposed to reasonable grounds to believe that negligence occurred. It, Am I, where, what have I missed? I, I apologize because I didn't, you, you kind of blurped out that you okay. said it strikes me that. It, it, it strikes me that, that we're getting into trial proof as opposed to re reasonable grounds to believe that negligence occurred because the negligence that is, is assigned here is not ordering more diagnostics when the clean mammogram came back. Am I, am I, have I got that right? Yes, that's correct. That's your theory of liability. If the gynecologist correct. had ordered additional, you should have ordered an ultrasound, whatever, to follow up on the clean mammogram because the plaintiff had dense breasts, which is apparently a medically recognized reason not to accept a clean mammogram in some instances. Um, is that yes. Okay. Yes. And so I... I when we get past that, because that's the negligence, which presumptively, because time goes by and she gets diagnosed later, the the meat of her damages is an oncologist testimony, but it's not the causation piece under your expert's opinion. So tell me what I'm missing. Well, I think what you're... I... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, this yes, is a friendly question. I want your opponent to answer the same one. On right. The, it, the meat, the meat of the damages is that, but I think that what you're, you're, you're really not missing anything. That is the meat of the damages. But the issue is, what does he have to say about it as the expert who opines for the purpose of corroborating that there's grounds to go forward? And isn't um, the jury instruction on negligence that you don't get to damages unless you find liability? Yes. Okay. And here, liability would be duty breach causation. And the causation would be the failure to diagnose at the outset and order additional testing. So the oncologist is theoretically would seem to be limited to quantifying the damages based on the treatment protocol later as opposed to sooner. Correct. And, and yes, correct. I mean, that is and, one of the I'm things I'm doing this in I, part because I want your your opponent to use her time right. in a way that makes sense for the questions that we have. Right. And, and and I think I think you've sort of gone down the road of hitting it on the head, which is, yes, the causation is that there's this failure to to diagnose at that point. And then an oncologist would be quantifying what those damages are because had you done it in month one versus month six versus- And you don't even later. get to that proof if the jury hasn't found, I mean, the jury doesn't get to that proof if they don't find liability. Right. Okay. Right. So, but 
backing up a little bit, I think that this court doesn't get even get there because I think that to get there, you have to begin to analyze the words that are used in the affidavit. And I think that Carmati has said that's not this court's role at this point. Um, and if, and to be clear, I mean, that's exactly what happened in Jackman. <laughs> and I understand you wrote the opinion in Jackman, but Jackman was very much about, there was an affidavit, it was from an expert, but the expert failed to mention sterile sponges and an injury. And this court said, you know, we can look beyond that, look at the quality of that affidavit, as opposed to just the fact that we check the box and you use the words check the box. And I actually have that on my notes. We've checked the box. We've done what we're supposed to do just to get to step two. Do we have a do we have a mountain to climb at trial? We may, but that's not that's not what the pre-suit um, statutes are designed to do. They're not supposed to flesh out you know, whether or not you can ultimately 100% prove your case, if that was the, if that, if that were to be the case, I mean, I don't think anybody would get through pre-suit. It's very difficult to gather all of the evidence you need to gather prior to filing the complaint. You haven't taken depositions. You don't have full discovery. You don't have every expert that you may ultimately have down the road to testify. So in terms of um, just getting there, you know, this doesn't even fail in the sense that of uh, council mentioned, mentioned Howell. Howell said could have potentially, and Rel said it requires more investigation. Those those things did not happen here. You actually have a you actually have a doctor who said this is this is what the breach was, and this is this is how they felt she fell be below the standard of care, and this is the the injury in in the end. Um, so the, the idea that this was never about that doctor's qualifications, and we talk about going back to the hearing, I mean, counsel for Dr. Verdeja said more than once, um, you don't have an opinion from a qualified expert. The court went through the determination under the statute and under Morris, which requires the court to just look at the qualifications of the expert, went through the list of qualifications and determined this expert is qualified um, and, and said, I'm not supposed to do more than that at this stage. So I, I don't believe that if we go to the merits of the case that the court uh, departed from the essential requirements of the law. She, you know, she went one by one and she said, okay, this is a gynecologist. You have a gynecologist. This gynecologist meets all of the requirements of 102. Um, and that's what she was required to do at the stage that she was being asked to do it. So if you're, if, as I said earlier, and I've, as we said in our response, um, I think that Carmati forecloses this court's jurisdiction to even address this issue. Um, and I think ultimately, no matter how you, no matter how you slice it, when it, when it's, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, the, the question is, was he, was he qualified? Um, qualifications can't be raised at the, the assert after commodity. And this is not an, this is not an issue of procedural. They've gotten, we've checked that box as Karmati, as the Karmati court said. Um, so I think that the appropriate uh, position should be to dismiss this. Oh, and I actually want to, I just want to address one more thing real quickly before I ask for the relief. Um, we filed a supplement, uh, Pradaxi versus Kendrick, which was issued in May of this year. And it's not directly on point, but I thought it sort of crystallizes this concept of having these multiple experts. In that case, the doctor who was the targeted defendant was a gynecology gynecologist, um, gynecological oncologist. And he argued that the gynecologist who gave an opinion about um, the standard of care under um, about the reasonable investigation was not qualified because um, he was not also a gynecological oncologist this subset. And, and it struck me because during the hearing on this issue, counselor for Dr. Verdeja said, we would have been okay had we obtained a gynecological 
oncologists who could then say both things. And the Sixth Circuit, um, the Sixth District rather, said, you know, that there's no requirement in the statute that you have these subspecialties. You're looking for the same specialty. You have to align the opinion from an expert who meets the qualifications that match your targeted defendant. So going back, it, I we filed a supplement of that case because it does just crystallize once again, that that's what is required here. So when you're looking at, at that uh, opinion and the expertise of, of that of the affidavit, you're looking to make sure that the doctor matches or the nurse or whoever matches the qualifications under 102. And you're not going to get into these different subspecialties of, well, there could be this down the road and this injury result. And now we need someone else to say something about that injury. I, I mean, I could see the door open wide for all the various it, times. I mean, I read the supplemental authority the other day and thought, well, they didn't sue a gynecological oncologist. They sued a gynecologist. Right. And that, and I again say this for the benefit of your opponent, I, I think that is a key part of why you filed the supplemental authority and would invite her to address that on her rebuttal. Okay. So as I said, unless you have any other questions, I, I think that this court actually has to dismiss. And if you go to the merits of it, then I think it, it should be denied because um, we definitely match apples for apples, the um, expertise required under the statute. Thank you, Ms. Colon. Thank you. Ms. Edwards, five minutes of rebuttal. Thank you. So to address some of the um, the arguments here, there was an argument that, you know, if the legislator wanted you to investigate and corroborate causation, they would have said that. And I believe that 766.203-2B very clearly says that, particularly the fact that the legislator divided that into A and B, making that two separate requirements, two separate boxes to check. And I understand the argument that you can't get to causation if you don't have a breach of a duty, and that's certainly true. But you cannot have a legitimate claim if you do not have a reasonable causation basis. And you cannot enforce the legislator's intent to eliminate frivolous claims unless you require a claimant to investigate and corroborate the causation part of their claim. If you do not rule that a claimant has to investigate the causation, the part B, the checkbox B under 766.2032, you render that section meaningless completely. Um, you allow frivolous claims to get through to trial and, and Judge LaRose pointed that out. At trial, you cannot win if you do not have causation. And the whole point of the pre-suit statutes is to prevent these frivolous claims, to prevent my doctor and other doctors from having to go all the way through the case, through trial, on a claim that is completely frivolous. And we have frivolous claims that have legitimate breach, duty and breach, legitimate standard of um, care breaches, but have no causation. If there is a delayed diagnosis of one hour, is there causation and damages? If it's one day, you've got to have a qualified expert to come in and say, yes, th there is causation. The cancer is now a different stage. She now has to have a different surgery, et cetera. That is required by 766.2032B. As far as the, the Carmody arguments, I certainly understand that that's um, pertinent. It, it's a newer case. I, I would agree with Ms. Colin that if you look at the hearing transcript, you can clearly see this is not a case where the judge weighed evidence. This is not a case where the judge decided on the qualifications of Dr. Brickner. We agree Dr. Brickner is qualified under 766.1025. That statute clearly only relates, is only applicable to standard of care, and that's not our argument. They have conceded in their letter that they would need an oncologist. What's, to the, appendix, what's the appendix site for that letter again? Sure, it's A99. Thank you. And, you know, I'll read it word for word what I'm talking about. He says, in a general sense, we might agree. And he's referring to the fact that we're saying Dr. Brickner is not qualified to comment on causation. 
But he says, please enlighten us as to when the notice requirement was expanded to require separate affidavits. He goes on to say that in almost every delay in diagnosis of cancer case, unless an oncologist was at fault, the target defendant and the specialty of the claim is being brought would not be the physician to opine on the harm, injury, or damages. He understands that an oncologist is the appropriate physician to comment on causation. And just like Ms. Col Colon said, if this case goes to trial, they're not having a gynecologist corroborate causation. They know that a gynecologist cannot corroborate causation. And our whole point is that if you don't require claimants to corroborate causation, you don't eliminate frivolous claims and you provide no meaning to 766.2032, which is clearly broken down into two separate parts. We've got standard of care and we've got causation and damages. You can also look at the trial court's order and see that she never weighed the qualifications of Dr. Brickner. She is just saying that all that is required is a standard of care expert. And that's the issue in this case. It is not an, a sufficiency of the evidence determination. It is procedural and it boils right down to whether a claimant is required to comply with 766-203-2B. And that is clearly procedural in nature. And that's why this court does have certiorari jurisdiction. As such, we'd ask this court to quash the trial court's order and either remand to the trial court to determine whether Dr. Brickner was qualified to render a causation opinion or in light of the concessions of the respondents, seeing that there's not really an evidentiary issue anyway, we all agree he's not qualified, go ahead and dismiss this case with prejudice as they failed to check all the boxes procedurally prior to the expiration of the statute of limitations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Thank you all. Uh, interesting issue, well argued. Uh, I think you have a button on your screens where you can exit our virtual courtroom. And we'll take up the next case, which is Tailored Interiors versus Burstein.